Hi, everybody, and welcome to Sunday night's event, the last event um, in the Dark Sky week for the Northumberland Dark Sky Festival. I'm Ryan Alexander. I have been your host all week, and I'm joined by a wonderful group of astronomers um, from the whole of Northumberland tonight. And I'm going to be one of them. Tonight, I am not your host. Tonight, your host is Duncan Wise. Um, he's uh, head of tourism, I think. He'll probably tell you all about that. Um, but I will be um, putting your questions from the live chat into our Zoom chat so Duncan can answer them. So uh, with that in mind, I shall hand you over to Duncan. Take it away. Thank you very much indeed, Roy. And first of all, a great big welcome to you all. And it's been a fantastic week. We've seen and heard some wonderful people talking about uh, the dark skies of Northumberland and some of the things that you can see. And I would like to, first of all, thank Roy for pulling this whole program together. It's been a monumental effort in a very short space of time. And uh, as I say, I hope you've all enjoyed and been entertained uh, by the, 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 the meetings that you've seen so far. As I say, I'm going to be the OMC. I'd love to say that I am sitting in front of a lovely log fire uh, and we can just imagine what this sort of fireside chat is, feels like, perhaps with a decent malt whiskey in our hand just mulling over things but we'll just have to visualize that um, but I'm going to do uh, a few questions um, of my talented uh, pool of people here and I'm going to start with Roy really because let's go back to basics let's go back to the beginning Roy you know what what inspired you to become an astronomer in the first place um, well, I've prepared for this um, because I've brought this out and this is the first telescope I ever got. Um, and actually, back then, I was really into putting stickers and everything. So this is the, the remnants of a Battlestar Galactica 1979 Cylon sticker. But this is a proper, look at that, a proper Captain Jack Sparrow refractor. And um, I pulled it apart the other day, and it still works. Not that you can see. See, look, you can see you can see it's still near wise through it's, it. It's so. that powerful. <laughs> yeah. So no, it was. I think it was my ninth or tenth birthday, and my granddad Don gave me this. My dad's dad, um, and um, and that was it. And he showed me with this. It's just about big enough. Uh, so one inch, um, the field of view is just about big enough to get the whole of the moon in it and the Pleiades. And I've got distinct memories of seeing those. And then on a Sunday afternoon, he showed me how to prop it up on some cushions, point it out the window at the sun and project sunspots onto a piece of paper. And I was like 10 years old. And that was it. And I was like, I'm going to be an astronaut. It's going to be, I'm going to be Neil Armstrong. It's going to be brilliant. Now, didn't quite make it to astronaut status. Um, but here I am. I would not be here with you lot today in this region, married with my family, with the jobs that I have, doing this, saying these words to you now, if it wasn't for this telescope. Fantastic. And did you use that, you know, because you were, it's at East Anglia you you were, grew up in, so, right? yeah, so were um, those the skies, the first skies that you saw through that telescope? They, they were, but I didn't really, I, I, I mean, obviously being nine or ten years old, you're not really allowed to go out and do stuff on your own. Um, it wasn't until I was about 14, 15 years old and we got a dog and I, had to take, I used to take the dog for a walk on the beach. Um, cause I lived between, I used to live, don't live now between, um, Great Yarmouth and Lowestoft. Um, and if you take your dog down onto the beach and you walk about half a mile that way, pitch black. And that was the first time I saw the Milky Way. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, that's fantastic. As I say, that, that sort of spark of inspiration has led to a lifelong passion. So, um, Nazanin, lovely to see you and uh, loved to hearing you the other night and uh, saw you recently on TV as well, of course, with, um, oh, awesome. <laughs> with uh, um, old Robson there. Um, but how, you know, you're, you're with Kyoto Observatory. How did you get into it all? Um, to be completely honest with you, um, it was I hadn't really heard of Kyoto Observatory until my ex-boyfriend actually started working there. Um, so he actually used to be one of the astronomers there. And um, I already had an interest in astronomy. So um, it sounded like this really cool place to me, obviously. And then he started working there and I kind of got involved with it all. So um, that's how I was introduced to it. But um, it was kind of, it started off from the outside looking in. I constantly wanted to be a part of the team. And after I finished my degree, um, it was just, it all worked out pretty well for me that it all, they timed it well. They needed more staff and I finished my degree. So 
Lovely. And uh, do you live quite close by or do you have to travel in quite a bit? In... Yeah, well, um, Kielder is the most remote village in England. So um, yeah. if you don't want to live out in the middle of nowhere, um, it is quite a commute. So I just live, I live just outside of Newcastle. Um, so it's about an hour and 15 minutes in there That's and back every day. Drive. So it's quite an adventure to get there, isn't it? But it's worth it, definitely. Fantastic. Definitely, yeah. I don't ever get tired of seeing those views going into Kielder. Um, I feel incredibly lucky to to drive into those views every day. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed, Nazanin. Will, you've come to this astronomy. You've always had a lifelong passion as well, haven't you? But you've been, your career's been in different paths, hasn't it, in the past? Yeah. So first of all, hi, Penny, Roy's mum. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, as a, as a seven-year-old, I was um, very interested in astronomy because of uh, Pat Sir Patrick Moore. And it was the Voyager probes, just passing the gas giants. And that inspired me to, to get into it. And as a seven-year-old, so I was determined, I thought, right, this is it. I'm going to get into astrophysics and be an astronomer. Hit the age of 12, went to see my careers advisor. And she said, right what are you going to do when you're older? And I thought, yes, I've got it. I'm going to be an astronomer. And she said, no. And she got, oh. a, she, she got a little book out and she said, an astronomer makes 12,000 a year. Well, this is back in the nineties, right? So I was thinking, I was 12 years old. I was thinking, oh, I didn't realize it was all about money. You know, I, I, mm. I guess, I guess I'm going to have to pick something else. So I, I studied business um, because I thought, well, if it's all about money, I'm going to have to study business. And, um, and that's what I did. And long story short, it got to 2007. So a long, long, many, many years later, I heard that Kielder Observatory was being built. And I got really excited and um, rang up and said, I want to be involved. And the guy on the phone said to me, we're not built yet. Uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll call you back next year. Well, you're on the waiting list. So I waited five years right? He never called me back. And um, I was in a bit of a huff, got to an event at Kielder. And I was like, sat there, like, you know, arms folded and thinking, you know, why didn't you want me to help out? And uh, they actually said, we're looking for volunteers. And I was like, right. And that, that's it. So about, I don't know how many years later, 20 odd years later, something like that, showing my age, um, got back into astronomy big time. And um, yeah, it's all, I mean, since 2012, 13, it's on. amazing, isn't it? I think it, there's, there's a similar story here. You know, it's that initial discovery of the night sky and, and being able to look through the telescope for the very first time at something that really brings yeah. it close and, and almost tangible, uh, but then realizing that it's so, so far away. It's, it's a very humbling experience, um, I found anyway. And I'm a very late comer because I, I can't really call myself an astronomer. I've, I've been involved with tourism and heritage interpretation for years and really I only came onto this table about sort of 10 years ago and it's been a voyage of discovery ever since because I've been with you guys you know I've learned a lot from just being around um, people that can actually show me things point out things and I think that's the wonder isn't it of live events and you know obviously we weren't able to do any live events uh, this year but we hope for 2022 we can repeat this and we can do uh, build on on this fantastic festival and have a combination of both online and real events as well. So, you know, I, I, I think we've, we'll be on that journey together. Liam, um, I know you again, again, going back to Kielder Observatory, it seems to be the sort of Orion Nebula of talent here in terms of seeding <laughs> uh, lots of wonderful stellar casts. Um, so um, tell us your story. My story that begins when I was just a wee thing. Um, I grew up in Newcastle, West End in Newcastle. Now, anybody who lives in the city, you'll know that if you can see more than 30 stars, half the city's got a blackout. Yeah, so we see a lot of stars. It wasn't until we actually came away camping as a family to uh -huh. a little village called Stuenhof. And I remember lying while everybody else was in that tent snoring. I'd be lying when we head out of this tent, looking up at the stars, getting eaten by midges. Of course. That didn't matter. <laughs> yeah, but it was... To see all those stars was inspirational. So that's what got me started. And then I spent 26 years working in a factory, which I hated. And in 2015, my wife 
without my knowledge, emailed Keeler Observatory and said uh, I'd be interested in volunteering. Fantastic. And then on the Monday, she told me, you're going up to Keeler. She says, oh, champion, <laughs> have you bought tickets? No, you're volunteering. I says, all right. And that was it. I was hooked. So... Well, we've got your wife to thank for a lot. So, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and in 2017, I started doing events here in the village. And then once the mortgage was paid off, my wife said, email the observatory, you're volunteering, ask them for a job. And that's what I did. So now I work part-time up at Keeler Observatory, 25 hours a week. And the rest of my time, I'm in the village doing my own thing. And you literally built your own observatory, didn't you, for the community? Yeah, more or less. <laughs> I mean, the Stargazing Pavilion was a joint effort between the uh, Newcastle College yeah. um, and various other organisations. But I've since dug a big hole and we've put in a, a warm room, which we intend to extend, and there's all kinds of plans in the often. So, yeah. It's looking good. Looking good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And George, last but not but no. By no means least. Um, good to see you. And uh, as I say, we probably don't know each other that well, but it'd be good to hear from you, George, um, how you've discovered the dark skies. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, so my, I guess my journey from into astronomy kind of started, might have started in a similar way to Roy's actually. So um, as you can probably tell by my accent, I'm not from the Northeast, not like Liam, um, from, from Suffolk. Uh, so not too far from Great Yarmouth um, and Lowestoft. So there's no real defining point, I don't think, in in my life that's kind of got me interested in into astronomy. It's kind of been a a gradual thing, I suppose. Um, many nights spent uh, trying to find meteors, or find, not find meteors, uh, trying to see shooting stars, rather, and um, sitting on the beach, or um, you know, long summer, uh, sort of warm summer nights, um, just sort of picking my dad's brain about astronomy and science and all that sort of thing kind of piqued my interest, I suppose. Uh, and it wasn't helped by the fact that my dad is a science teacher and was my science teacher at school. <laughs> um, so I could never really escape it, to be honest. And oh, it was sort of a natural progression <laughs> from there. Uh, studied uh, astrophysics at university um, in London, moved up to the Northeast. Um, and yeah, kind of like Naz then, didn't really know much about Kielder Observatory. I tried to get tickets to um, have a guest go up to see Kielder Observatory, but um, they were always sold out. So when I moved up, it was kind of on my radar. And yeah, just, I just applied for a job and that was that really. I've been there since 2018. So a couple of years, just over two years. Fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's amazing, isn't it? Everyone's got their own personal journey. And as I said, you talk about coming not from this region, as you can tell, neither am I. I came up here 20 years ago and I'm originally from Kent, so I, I couldn't be further south. <laughs> so yeah. but it's been, been a pleasure. And as I say, the joy of discovering Northumberland. And, you know, I came up here 20 years ago. I was working for Exmoor National Park before then. And I, to be honest, I had never even visited Northumberland before I, I got the job. And this mm. job of, of sort of heading up the sort of tourism side certainly was a, a very attractive one. And, you know, when we landed up here, the first thing, first thing that struck me, being used to so many sort of southern county landscapes, which are very wooded and lots of rolling hills and the villages are quite close together. You know, everything's quite compact and quite close. And suddenly discovering this county where you are literally you know your breath is taken away by the sort of long you know it's, it's not called the land of the far horizons for nothing you know you've got mm. these wonderful open vistas uh rolling um sort of horizons going off into the distance and then these large skies which i know you know being in you know, east anglia you're probably used to because you've got some wonderful skies down there mm. but i th i think that sense of wildness that that sort of wildness within the beauty of the landscape struck me and has always you know, stayed with me ever since. But it's really then discovering the clarity on a clear night, when we do get clear nights, and we do, um, of seeing so many thousands of stars above us. And, and that is something that really does take your breath away. I just wonder, how, how do you feel personally about Northumberland? You all found yourselves here in Northumberland. Is there something really special about the Northumbrian skies that you think is worth telling people about? 
Um, I, I'll ask Nazanin. Um, so I didn't quite realize how special it was until, so I'm, I, I'm originally from Manchester. I grew up in Manchester um, and we have the Peak District nearby, obviously. And that used to be my stopping <laughs> I used to take my telescope out into the Peak District and set up my telescope outside my boot, the boot of my car and look up at the skies and I used to think, wow, these skies are incredible, <laughs> um, just because I'd driven outside of Manchester. But then um, going into, the, into Northumberland and seeing those skies, um, it takes your breath away. But then I think coming back to Manchester and going back to my old stomping ground and looking at the skies that I used to think were absolutely incredible. They're still really stunning skies, but... I just don't think people quite realize how much of a difference it makes being in, an, in a protected international dark sky park until you really see it for yourself. Um, we get, we sometimes get nights where the, the Milky Way is so bright that it feels like you don't even need a torch out. Um, and I yeah. just think that it's, yeah. it's a really special experience. And with only 80% of people in the UK, uh, sorry, 80% of people in the UK have never actually seen a dark sky. Um, I think it's definitely something that everyone should at least experience once. Yeah. That's quite yes, that's quite a shocking statistic, isn't it? When when yeah. you when you hear that, you think you know most of us are now living in towns and cities, and many people, you know, second, third generation may have just lived in towns all their lives, and mm -hmm. for many, that is what the night sky looks like for most people, and unless they get the opportunity to come away from the streetlights and find these sort of sanctuaries of darkness. Um, around the UK, uh, and then suddenly, you know, they are literally, you know, um, breath, you know taken aback by it, by the beauty of it all. Um, Will, how about you? As I say, are there any specific places within Northumberland that you feel are your favourite places to to look at the night sky? Well, I have to say, you know, like I said, I've been stargazing now with you know big since Kielder days, really big telescopes, and about uh, five years ago, I went to uh, the Atacama Desert. And this is before I got into photography, right? So it's just so sad. I didn't even have a camera, didn't know how to use a camera. I'm, I'm in the desert, you know? And, um, but anyway, I remember um, obviously seeing how amazing it was in the Atacama Desert. And my feeling is that that would be the absolute best skies. But I have to say a few months ago, a good friend of mine, uh, Neil, uh, came up to, twice brood you can see the milky way here mm -hmm. and uh we we've got um and we've got a big telescope nothing like what kilda have but we've got a big 14 inch uh, reflecting telescope and neil had just purchased this really powerful eyepiece right and he, he wanted to test it out and we wanted to really give you know the northumberland skies a go i have to be honest i mean that night for both of us completely changed how i saw everything because i'd never seen the ring nebula as spectacular before in any skies. It lit, we, we honestly both, I mean, Neil's, uh, you know, an astronomer for many years and myself, and it was a massive shock, Duncan, because we know the skies are great in Northumberland, right? Mm -hmm. But the things that we saw using the best equipment we could possibly get to see the ring nebula the way it is, to see Messier 13, the globular cluster, you know, at twice brood was... I'm not saying it's just twice brood, it's a whole of Northumberland, you know, Northumberland Dark sure. Sky Park, sure. but it was a complete game changer because yes, I believe that the skies are great here. And of course I do, but to kind of have the equipment to go, right, let's really see how, how good the skies really are. And it just, I was absolutely mind blown. Absolutely mind blown. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Now, as I say, there are some, as I say, you don't necessarily have to come that far away from street lighting do to, to to get that sense anywhere in in northumberland really but as i say you you're located up on hadrian's wall aren't you so you know when you're looking up on hadrian's wall looking north there's very little population for many many miles uh really right up at, until you get to kielder and then beyond that there's very little population we are very lucky that we tend to we're in this this what i call a sort of black velvet collar isn't it that it covers the whole of the borders you know from the tyne gap right up to sort of um you know in Leithen and and right up into the scottish borders there's just blackness you know we've got the galloway forest 
um, Dark Sky Park. That was the first one that was designated by the International Dark Sky Association in 2009. Since then, we've also had Moffat as a dark sky community. We've got Northumberland as an international dark sky park since 2013. There's a wonderful opportunity maybe to merge them together and that's create this sort of protected dark sky across the whole region. I have um, to say, I, I was, um, sorry, I was in the Caulfield's Quarry um, oh, yeah. because, you know, Caulfield's War Town, very close to us, you know, at Twice Brewed and very, very dark, you know, very, very dark. And I, I remember I promised you, I said, right, Duncan, when it's next clear, no moon, I'm going to go out by myself to take photographs for you, right? And so. you're saying about no population. So middle of the night, okay, I'm driving into Caulfields, and this is ridiculous. So I get out of the car, and because I'm aware there's no one around, I think I, I'm actually quite scared. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, this is ridiculous. Here's me. You know, I love the night skies and, and to photograph stuff. But I mean, it was literally I could hear any like any noise, you know, a wild, wild bird or something. Yeah. I mean, it's just it's just brilliant. Really, really dark skies. And as you say, hardly hardly anyone around. And I think you're right. I think Caulfields is one of my favorite sites, I think, because you've got that sort of slightly the, the edge of the quarry that tends to block off any kind of light yeah. dome in any direction. So you're literally kind of sunken in this sort of slight um, recess and, and you just don't get any light pollution at all. But Liam, where you are, you know, you're right in the middle of this bark forest, you know, must be one of the darkest places. And I can understand when you're a kid looking out the tent that time, how you must have been blown away by it all. But uh, is that still your favourite location? It is. Yeah, I love working up at Kielder, but I can just step out my back door. I live in the dark sky park, you know. Yeah. So as soon as we get clear skies, even if it's only for a brief time, I can just step out the back door and I'm there. You know, all those stars overhead. It's amazing. Fantastic. You know, so yes. I yeah, wouldn't live move. anywhere else. <laughs> 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 no, it's a privilege to have them, isn't it? Actually, oh, especially when you go elsewhere and you go down. I see, you know, go if I go south or whatever, I'm talking to friends or family or whatever. The, the fact that they, you have to try and describe how dark it is because they're yeah. just not, not used to it. I and, went, I went and, down. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I went down to the wet, uh, the coast road last year to set oh, up yeah. some telescopes for a gentleman. And uh, living on the coast road, and you couldn't see more than 20 stars. You know, but he wanted yeah. these telescopes set up. And I had to say to him, you need to come out. You need to come out to Northumberland and yeah. just see the difference. If you're interested in astronomy, come out. Come and have a look. Because it is amazing. Yeah. Love it. No, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Roy, for you, you've had a quite a long association now with the Battlesteads Hotel, haven't you? Because you and uh, Richard got together some years ago to create the, the Battlesteads Observatory. How did that come about? Yeah, well, um, I mean, actually, I was also once lead astronomer at Kielder. Um, so we all we all have the Kielder links here. Um, and just, I guess, like everybody else, you know, you hear about the place. Um, I don't know about any of, of, of you folks, but I, um, when I first heard about the place, I walked up there during the day one time just to see what it was all about. Um, and then went along as a guest a couple of three times. And uh, I remember being in one of the telescope rooms and it, looking at stuff and someone's, and it was a beautiful clear night and somebody, one of the people there said, right, let's go in for, our, for my talk now. And everyone filed out and I just didn't really hear that. So I stayed in the, in the room on my own for half an hour looking right. through this eyepiece. I can't remember what it was I was looking at, but I just stared at it for half an hour. And that was it, it was great. Um, and I came to Northumberland uh, in 1989. God, that's so long ago to do my degree, which originally was astrophysics, but I couldn't do the maths. And the people were like, uh, you know, look, look at the stars, go to Close House Observatory, which is now of course a golf course. Mm. Um, and it, it was just maths, it was, re it was really hard. So I changed to geophysics mm. and astrophysics, planetary physics. So I didn't have to do the maths, still got to do the astronomy, win-win. <laughs> Um, so that was good. Um, and I left Kielder um, just wish because I've, I've been, I'm a teacher as well. I've been a physics teacher for 25 years on and off. Uh, yeah. And working in and around this region, I mean, any region, I guess, um, you, you can see a lot of um, kind of uh, poverty and a, lot of, a lack of opportunity in some of the schools around. Um, and I saw a lot of that. And, and 
And I, I kind of, when I was working at Kid, I was just thinking, why aren't we doing more in schools? Why aren't we doing actual free charitable stuff in schools for schools? And, and it, it wasn't happening. And one, one or other reason I, I left and I thought, okay, I'll just do my own, you know, I'll just I'll get a telescope and do my own thing. And I did that a little bit. And as you said, then I met Richard and he was like, I'm going to build an observatory. And I was like, great, okay. And he said, do you want some lunch? Let's have a look at the plans. And I was like, oh, okay. So we sat out in the garden and we looked at that and I was like, well, why don't you turn it around this way and make it bigger and do this and do that and do the other and blah, blah, blah. And he was like, okay. And I was like, right, okay. So the next thing I know is he's building an observatory to my specifications. Um, and, and I'm working there through working, <laughs> working. I don't know about you folks, um, but when people say, ask you, where do you work? In your head, do you kind of go work, working? Is it really work? You know, it's... I guess it can, like any job, there can be times when it feels like that, but we're also lucky. Um, yeah, and I was lucky enough to build up a team of people around me who, by and large, are actually better than me at everything. So that was great. Um, and then in the last year or, or two, I've been trying to get back into the teaching thing. Um, but from an astronomy STEM, we've been doing STEM stuff, mentoring, things like that, working with a couple of charities and so on. And just as we were about to do that, the bloody virus hit, didn't it? Yeah. So um, I've actually really enjoyed doing this. This has been, you're right, we did kind of, we didn't, I don't, you know, you, me and Will and a couple of people and Liam were talking about this um, back in the, the end of November, December. So it's been mm, put mm. together really quickly, but it's been really fun. Um, my my favourite thing about, uh, about uh, Northumberland, obviously, is just the vast expanse of, like, countryside and, and, you know, I mean, I, I've not yet been to, to, to Twice Brood to see how uh, dark it is there. Um, I did take some nice pictures at the sill there with my mobile phone uh, a couple of times. Couple of times, I tried to get to Stonehoff once, but got lost. So um, <laughs> let's give that another go. And obviously, I love Battlesteads. Um, for, for me, it's like dark skies, but also, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of a bit of civilization, which is great. But what I love doing is, it, you know, all these little dark sky spots and places and laybys and country roads and tracks. And I tend to drive home if it's a clear night, because I live in Gateshead, and I tend to drive home along the military road. Mm. And there are so many spots along there that you can stop, pull your car out of the way safely and just enjoy the sky. Um, and for me, it's, it's you, you you know if the aurora is kicking off that's that's you know i can be i can stop and see it on the way home it's fantastic no absolutely true as i say i think that the, the military road is actually a very good road sometimes i know even mm -hmm. closer to to newcastle I, the newcastle astronomical society used to go out to valham farm quite often and i think that was one of my very first um experiences going out and just uh joining some of the members out there who again there's a really important role i think for um astronomical societies aren't they because oh, they definitely. do they're yeah. very open they, they're very engaging you've got very enthusiastic passionate members who are very keen to share their passion and also you know, tell you a lot about what you're looking at so i, yeah, I, I, I think you've got a lot to thank Definitely. I mean, so let's just give them all a shout out. So there's Newcastle Astronomical Society, yep. there's Northumberland Astronomical Society, and there's Sunderland Astronomical Society, um, who I think have like thousands of online members. Their, their Facebook page is very dynamic. And I must say, I, I don't think I would have got half a really big, big shout out to all the members of Sunderland Astro because I wouldn't have done half of what I could have done with the Battlestars actually without their help. Yeah, um, no, I totally agree. Totally agree. And George, you know, when when you obviously you're traveling up to to Kilda and and both you and Nazanin are, are sort of employed up there doing a lot of the the work. But you know, in your own spare time, do you find that you find time to to go out and do your own stargazing? And are you hauling telescopes all over Northumberland yourself, or do you just tend to to use the opportunity you have at work? Um, yeah, that's a it's a funny one, really. So I I do live in Newcastle actually. So in terms of uh, actual clear clear nights here it's a bit difficult so we do have to drive a long way to get away from this orange glow that is Newcastle uh, which at the moment is a bit tricky um, but I have got my own telescope I've got a little um, eight centimeter celestron which I try and take out and my partner I try and drag along with me now and then um, but she doesn't She's not too keen on it. So I don't get out as much as I'd like. Um, <laughs> but we did have, actually, funny enough, just before Christmas, I think it was mentioned earlier, we, we actually had a blackout 
um, for half, well, quite a lot of Newcastle was just dark and including us here. So we decided to get outside because it was a nice clear night and just go for a quick walk and see what we could see. And we saw nothing because it was still too bright. Like the rest of Gate said across the river and the rest of Newcastle, which was still light, uh, was just ruining our view of the night sky. So I think it's very difficult to sort of quantify how dark is a good dark sky. And yeah. I'd say it's that, even though there's half of Newcastle, there's a blackout and you go outside and still can't see anything um, compared to, you know, when you get it out into Northumberland, it's, it's beautiful. But yeah. Um, I do try and get out when I can, but not as often as I'd like. <laughs> wow. That's great. As I say, I think, as I say, there are so many places that you can go to. And as I say, there are one or two of our favourite places that we've already um, alluded to, which is, is, is fantastic. I suppose, you know, we've also talked about how do we get younger people? How do we get, you know, the educational role that all of you as, as observatories, you know, we've, we've had four observatories. It's amazing just to say that, isn't it? We've actually got four observatories in one International Dark Sky Park mm. um, on our doorstep here in Northumberland, which is amazing. Um, how, how important do you see that educational role in, in sort of certainly engaging with those who are living in, say, Tyneside and, and Wearside to bring them out here? You know, maybe Kilda, what, can you just tell us a little bit about the programme programs that you're involved with at the moment or, or planning? Yeah, um, I can take this one, I suppose. Um, yeah, it's, it's massive. It's, it's massively important, I think, um, to educate as many people as you can, really, who are, who are interested uh, about astronomy. Because firstly, it's very much lacking from the national curriculum in schools. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's quite obvious. I think you can talk to any student from whichever year across, you know, years one to 13 and astronomy is not really anything they tackle until their later years I suppose if they're doing A-level physics um, and so for us at Kilda we've got a couple of projects that we're running or we, we're trying to get into schools more so we have uh, one which Adam uh, Shaw our colleague he, he kind of leads uh, where we're in schools um, with uh, in the north of Tyne um, with a big in place called Planetarium when we can uh, which is a perfect incubator for coronavirus. So we haven't been able to do that <laughs> recently. Um, and, you know, just, just to teach them about meteorites and all fairly basic stuff with astronomy to kind of enthuse them to go on to pursue STEM careers, I suppose, in the sciences, uh, in the astronomy as well. Um, and then there's also another project that myself and uh, Adam is, are also working on, actually, which is to... Um, to get back into schools when they reopen and mm -hmm. run a series of about 10 workshops on a weekly basis uh, where we teach them about the heritage of the Northeast uh, and astronomy in the Northeast. So Rob Parsons, which was a manufacturer of telescopes in, in Newcastle, is something people don't really know about, mm -hmm. um, including William and Carolyn Herschel as well. Um, yes. Have you got yes. a... Your hand up there, Roy. Roy yes. Just... So, Ad, Ad, when when you finish your little your little yeah. um, bit, I wouldn't mind coming in on this because I've got some sure. relevant, interesting information to you. But please, for now, carry on. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was I was just about finished, really. Um, the, yeah, the Herschels, William Herschel, Carolyn Herschel, who lived and worked in Newcastle for a time as well. It's, there's a lot of heritage in the northeast with astronomy, which I think is very important for people to know about. So that's kind of what we're trying to work into schools especially in targeting the younger students um to pursue stem careers yeah yeah no that's fantastic and so until this week relatively unknown isn't it as i say so mm. Carl Parsons, you know they, these were making world-class astronomical telescopes that went yeah, all over yeah. the world you know and i didn't know about that until you know very very recently and when i came up here so roy mm. yes yeah, so um, we've done, as part of this week's uh, festival, we've done two events, uh, I think they were Wednesday and Thursday, where we had David Hughes talking about the history of astronomy in the Northeast in a great deal of depth. We got to an hour and he was like, oh, because I gave him a five minute warning. He said, you're going to have to give me a five minute warning while I get carried away. So I gave him a five minute warning. And he said, oh, I, as he was talking, he said, oh, Roy's just told me I've got five minutes. And everybody in the chat was like, carry on. So we carried on for 25 more minutes. And that's on this um, playlist, actually. And it starts with the Venerable Bede, who was an astronomer. True. To some degree. That's very true. 
and talks about Carolyn Herschel, talks about Grub Parsons and all of that, which is fantastic, and then touches upon um, the Newell telescope that was built here in Gateshead by Robert Newell um, and actually was sighted about 50 metres from my house in Saltwell Park that way. And at the time was the largest refracting telescope in the world. And I believe it was, I now should, now Dave Newton did this talk. Some of you may know Dave Newton as the founder member of Sunderland Astronomical Society. And um, I believe he was there right at the beginning with Keeler Observatory. Uh, I think he left shortly after me. So um, we, we worked, met and worked together there. And he does this great talk, which is again, has been live streamed and is recorded called From Gateshead to Galaxies, The Peculiar, the Peculiar History of the Telescope. Um, and that telescope is now working and it's still kind of in existence in an observatory in Athens, in Athens. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, and it's astonishing. I mean, I every time I listen to these two uh, real legends of actually Northeast astronomy do their talks, because I always tune in, there's always bits of extra information. Um, and it's it's absolutely, I mean, you're bang on right, George. It's fascinating. So. Mm -hmm. No, amazing history, and as I say, amazing yeah. heritage that that probably very few people until very recently, you know, know about. And um, it's it's good to, to bring that up again. Um, in terms of uh, you know, where we sort of about to sort of engage in, do you think there's a, a a challenge actually just getting people out? I, I I've been working in tourism, uh, for the national park for twenty years, and one of the challenges is just getting people out, the the transportation and the ability for people. Uh, especially on low incomes, to be able to travel out to a, a beautiful place like Northumberland National Park is 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 quite a barrier. So you know we've demonstrated maybe through these online events this week, you know that we've reached a lot more people, haven't we, than perhaps through the traditional way of maybe just having a, a stargaze and event. Um, so how many of you do you think are going to be more involved with online uh, sort of astronomy in the future? Who wants to get? Yeah, that's good. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, look, um, in terms of, um, you know, we've mentioned about light pollution and light pollution is, is something obviously that, you know, uh, right across the UK and in fact, globally, the, the reason why the International Dark Sky Association was created in the first place was to really raise the profile and raise public awareness around the amount of light pollution that's being generated, uh, mostly obviously from our towns and cities where you get these large conurbations and it's a very densely populated area with a lot of street lighting, uh, highways lighting and, and industrial and business lighting. And obviously a lot of that is actually sort of shining upwards into the night sky and, and causing light pollution. Um, I will decide to get some sort of general feedback on how you feel, you know, is this a problem that you feel is, is growing? Is it something we should be dealing with? And and if so, what do you think would be a good approach to, to um, tackling this issue of light pollution? I'll just send that out there to any of you to, to answer, first of all. <laughs> okay, well, I'll check. Liam. Yeah, um, well, like I say, I grew up in Newcastle, uh, which is, like you say, heavily saturated with uh, those lovely orange lights. When I moved to the village, we've got, I think we've got seven streetlights, which have all now been replaced with LEDs. Yeah. Um, and the difference is amazing. Even out here in Box Guy Park, just having those seven streetlights left this nasty. It wasn't too bad for observing, but if you wanted to do any imaging, it picked it up straight away, you know. So even in a dark sky area, a small amount of light like that can make a massive difference. Yeah. So the LEDs, I know there's a lot of uh, the councils are heading towards them when they're replacing uh, the older lights that are automatically going, not because of the light pollution, but because of financial, uh, you know, they save a lot of money running LEDs. But it's, it's, a, it's a good reason to change them, and if it makes a difference, all the better. Yeah. And I think that they are better designed, aren't they? Because when you look at the, the street lights. Yes, they're fully shielded in the fact that when we talk about when we say fully shielded, we mean all the light is literally shielded from strain above the horizontal. So it's shining down on the ground. Obviously, one of the issues though with some of the LEDs is 
is the, the the spectrum of white color, isn't it? So you know we've yes, got very blue rich LEDs, which um, are not so good. We know that they yeah. um, affect the way that sort of nocturnal wildlife uh, behaves in terms of flight patterns for moths and various other insects, yeah. um, and obviously the ramifications that has um, through the sort of food chain and the uh, the mm -hmm. ecology of of the night. Um, it also isn't that good for sleeping patterns either because it's kind of replicating the kind of daylight that you'd see on a very clear, bright blue sky day. And, and you know, that's fine. At We're all astronomers, so it's not really a problem for us. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. We're to sleep yes. during the day. <laughs> you have different sleeping patterns <laughs> altogether. No, okay. I'm probably the wrong group to ask. <laughs> but yeah, in terms of, certainly it's the amount of light, isn't it? And I think, you yeah. know, it's been driven very much by saving saving money in terms yes. of energy costs, primarily. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's good because, like you say, that they're directed, therefore, they lighten up the area you need lit up. So the paths are all clearly lit. Yet yeah. there's no wastage, there's no right. upward light, so it's perfect. So long as you get that balance right, I think, and so so, yeah. long, so long as there's not too much light being emitted, because obviously you get that reflected light as well, which can yes. be a problem. Um, but um, how? What do other people th think think about uh, sort of this change to LED lighting? Anyone got any particular views at all? Yeah. So um, I, I I think about five six years ago. I did some research and I thought I want to go somewhere in Europe that has the least light pollution, but also the least amount of precipitation, <laughs> right? right? Okay, let's think about this one. Basically, as little clouds as possible. And I identified a place in Spain, okay, and I thought, perfect. And um, I went online and there was a bit of land. And so I had a dream of building a little observatory in Al Almeria on the, on the south coast of uh, Spain. So um, I was so excited. I looked on the chart, light pollution map, hardly got any light pollution, and I nearly purchased it without even visiting because it was really cheap. And then uh, my friend said, you know what? You should really check this place out before you go. And I was like, but it's in the middle of nowhere. I'll be fine. Long story mm -hmm. short, we got there and uh, went there during the day, <laughs> okay, and I thought, yeah, this looks all right. Perfect. Great. No light pollution. Drove all the way back to the city because it was a bit of a like a two hour drive. And then at mid midnight, I thought to myself, I need to go back. I, I mean, uh -huh. this is ridiculous. I've come all the way here. I need to check it out at night. Drove all the way back. And I found out that the village next door had all these LED lights in, right, right. installed but it was like the worst possible kind you can imagine. It, I don't know. It was so weird. And, yes. and that's just complete. I just, that for me was the moment where I thought to myself, yes, LEDs is the future, but maybe the way it's shielded and designed is far more important. And so that was, that was a big lesson. That was a big lesson. I, I think you're right. I think sometimes, you know, we're, we're, sometimes casting the blame very much onto the big towns and cities for creating the pollution that's affecting us in rural areas but actually as you say at a very local level you know just the uh the installation of an outside light on the side of a building if it's done incorrectly and it's angled outwards and it's one of these you know led floodlights that you can buy from any sort of diy superstore very cheaply you know the fact that these led lights are so ubiquitous are so cheap and so simple to install, but they can emit a very harsh glare, uh, a blue white light that, you know, whereas before, um, you know, you might have had, say, a hundred watt incandescent light bulb in a bulkhead light above your doorway just to show you where your door was so you could get there easily at night. You can now replace that, and many people are. Um, and, you know, the same amount of light can now be emitted from an eight or 10 watt LED light. But there's something called the Jevons paradox. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's, it's you know, if you're studying sort of economics, it's a sort of way you find some way of um, m making a, 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 a relatively sort of finite resource more efficient in the way that you use it. You don't use less of it. You actually increase the use of it. So, you know, mm -hmm. people are now taking in you know, off their sort of 100 watt incandescent light bulb and then putting up something like a 30 watt LED light thinking, oh, well, I'm still saving two thirds energy, but in fact, it's now 
putting out three times the amount of light that you actually need. So it's about that question of, you know, asking people to say, well, how much actual light do you need? Obviously, we do need light at night in rural areas. People feel safe having a bit of light outside just to be able to walk around their property. Um, and some people feel safe from a security point of view, although the evidence now is beginning to say that actually overlit areas are not so safe. You know, people are finding that, you know, burglars like light too. So, um, you know, that argument is perhaps uh, not so strong as it was in the past. Can so it's I... about having, you know, the right amounts of light for what you want it to do uh, at the right time without over lighting or literally, you know, causing a, a lot of disturbance, especially if you're, you know, outside, you don't want this light to be shining across the valleys for two or three miles. Uh, because once you see it, you can't not see it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. the real problem. Roy, did you want to come in with something? It, it was just I could, because um, I know that Will, I think, is an IDA delegate. Um, I'm an IDA delegate. I know that some of the Kielder folks are involved with the IDA. I think Dan's a delegate. Naz, are you any? Do you do anything with the IDA or light pollution or anything? No, not right now. No. Okay, I, I'll not. I'll not kind of put you on the spot then. Um, but so so that, so that's a useful thing though. Are the International Dark Sky Association getting kind of um, more active in the UK um, because there's a, a couple of things, and the one was that what you were talking about with the move to LEDs. Um, that's fantastic, in as much as it is directed downwards, which is great. But what I'm finding out at the minute is you can't really buy street lighting in an efficient, effective and cost efficient way that's at the right kind of color temperature, 2000, um, well, they say 2700 Kelvin and below, which uh, gives your, um, your, your sky a, a bit more of a soft, warmer glow. So we're kind of back to the sodium lamp days. So a lot of them made the move to the LEDs a few years ago for the efficiency, for the cost savings, um, and just bought the four or 5,000 Kelvin ones. So now they've got a legacy problem, which is less than three or four years old, which is not really that much of a, a, a time scale for a legacy problem, um, but they are all aware of it. And councils have a big push now to decarbonize as well. Um, mm -hmm. And they are all getting to grips with the idea that nocturnal pollinators, nocturnal animals form part of our food chain. And just because we all go to bed at night, and you know, a lot of farmers and people like that and food producers go to bed at night. Doesn't mean the animals do, doesn't mean the insects do. Um, so so it's a really interesting thing. And I'm I'm actually really looking forward to working with with Will and 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 Dan um, to try and turn some of the uh, towns and cities that we have along the Tyne into urban night sky places. I know that Will, are you still thinking about doing that with Hexham? Is that yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, it's funny, isn't it? Because I, I don't know what it is. I feel that there are some people out there and that's fine. You know, they, they think that having lots of lights is amazing. You know, they just want like runways and airport yeah. style, like the brighter, the better. And the thing about Hexham is there's actually a lot of investment coming in. Um, you know, they're, they're looking at building a McDonald's, a big travel lodge um, and just build more and more things. So my obviously my biggest concern is too much light pollution. So yeah. um, with, with my connections with a lot of the folks there, the factory and everything else we're working on and working with Duncan on it as well, with support, yeah. we're, we're going to see if we can, um, you know, hopefully make Hexham a dark sky town, but yeah. uh, I, that would be fantastic. I mean, that would just, that would do, that would not just benefit everybody in Hexham, but it would benefit all of us, all of us sitting here, all six of us and all of our teams and everybody who comes to Northumberland. Because here's another thing is people in Hexham, people in Corbridge, you know, we, we really need to promote and push astrotourism, um, especially, I mean, in a post-COVID world, how many people are really going to go overseas in the next two, three, four years for holidays? Um, a lot of people are going to be looking for, you know, vacations at home. And, and it, improving light pollution, um, is going to improve that because if we are as a as a as a group of people if if as a region we're like trying to lead the way um then more and more people are going to want to come here for their holidays rather than go 
to one of the other, no doubt, fantastic, you know, dark sky places. But obviously, we want them to come to us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yes, there are wonderful dark sky places, and in, in, in all in the whole of the UK, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, but, but come here. We want you in Northumberland. You know, I think, um, and I just, but well, sorry, I had one thing just to give a number on security because the biggest objection I'm getting at the minute when I'm talking to people about this, and I've got an official capacity in that now is but we need to deal with the crime and i'm like well yeah you just got to speak to some of the people in london where they've done research on this and where they've deliberately improved and brightened lighting crime has gone up by yeah. about 20 percent yeah yeah which is you just that's so counterintuitive yes. um yeah no I, I agree and i think there are two ways that we can approach it and as i say i'm talking working for a national park authority and we have we are a planning authority so when it comes to new development one of the commitments that we made when we became an international dark sky park was the fact that we needed to use what mechanisms and and what policy uh we could develop to ensure that the dark skies stay dark and yeah. through planning we we offer something called a pre-application uh, sort of consultancy. So any developer that is wanting to submit a planning application to develop within the National Park, they get uh, advice from planners on, you know, the, you know, the legislation and, and what they can and, and perhaps cannot build, um, depending on, on our local plan. And we always give, obviously, ad free advice around the fact that, you know, we're in a dark sky park. So any kind of proposal for any outside light, we ask normally for a design statement and then we can see very early on what kind of lighting they're proposing to do and we can then advise them on perhaps saying well actually rather than having that light you know have one that's fully shielded or one that's maybe on the motion sensor that comes on when you need it rather than on all night uh, do you really need that level of lighting you know you could perhaps still maintain safe access and egress around your property without necessarily you know lighting it up like St James's Stadium so you know, and to be honest every developer that, that we've approached and engaged that way has has said yes fine they've, they've not kicked up a fast I don't think people necessarily go out there to over light their property I think they just go out there thinking that actually you know this one's cheap I'll buy this one and I'll just whack it up they don't really think about this sort of wider impact and I think once people are aware of the impact they're very willing and very ready to make those changes, especially when, you know, they're, they're not going to cost you any more. You know, it's, it doesn't cost you more to have a better design, fully shielded light than it is to have one that's badly designed and, and badly installed. But I think that's just one mechanism because legislation in this country is, is relatively limited in terms of what it can do in terms of um, stopping light pollution. The more effective way I find is through events, you know, through doing stargazing events, astronomical events, and actually imparting at the beginning why, you know, this is a dark sky park. And I have a simple sort of mock-up light board with lots of different lights, which I switch on. Some of them are you know, unshielded, some of them are fully shielded, whatever. Literally, I switch them all. I, I should have it with me somewhere, but, you know, it's phasing. Fine. Five minutes they can see i the think you should lights. get that out duncan <laughs> I'll try and find <laughs> i think we should before you know, the I end mean, of this before the I, end of this obviously world. we don't want to turn this into um like a sermon uh on dark skies no. and light pollution because we will just lose you know uh, viewers <laughs> Absolutely. Like that. Absolutely. um we do have some questions coming in i will lovely fire them into okay the chat lovely to take you. some i'll try them into the front for Fire, okay. fire them well, into the chat. Thank you. Well, whilst whilst we're waiting for some questions, one thing I'm going to ask you all is that going back to stargazing. Can anyone? You know, what's what's your favourite uh, nighttime sort of constellation or celestial object that you like to look at? And I'll pose that question to Nazanin. Have you got a favourite at all? Ah, uh, it's a bit of a tough one. Um... I know that the moon can be a little bit of a controversial one with other astro astronomers because some nights you just really want it to go away. <laughs> but um, I can honestly, hand on heart, say that every single time I've looked at the moon through a telescope, it has just blown me away. Um, just because every single time you look at it because of its different phases and where the termination line falls, um, it's just it gives you something new to look at every single time. Um, and obviously we get um, lunar eclipses a lot more often as well. So you have that and it's just the most diverse of the celestial objects really. Um, and yeah, like I say, it always looks really incredible through a telescope and it doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't even have to be a big telescope. It doesn't have to even be a telescope. It could be a pair of binoculars. 
um, it still looks incredible. So it's accessible. It's beautiful. I just love it. Okay. That sounds a good answer to me. No, I think, you know, we sometimes take the moon for granted, don't we? And, you know, as I say, we are either trying to avoid it or whatever. But, you know, you, you get a, a sort of six year old looking through a telescope for the very first time at the moon and seeing yeah. something like behind Roy there. Yeah, boys. You know, they're just um, amazed by it. You know, it's, it's, it's magical, absolutely magical. How about you, Liam? Well, mine has to be this one here. Ah. The yes. Orion Nebula. Now, it's not as dramatic through a telescope as the moon. I have to agree with Nas there. Um, but just the object itself, what it is, how far away it is, what's going on in there. Just yeah. there's so much information, so much going on. And when you go online and you do a bit of research on this object, it's just, it's mind bending. You know, young stars being born within this gas giant. It's just fantastic. So uh, it might just look like a little smudge through a telescope, but it's a dramatic smudge. It's amazing. And I think you're right. And it's also relatively easy to find for most people, especially when they're oh, beginning, yes. aren't they? It's the one that yeah. you can show them that isn't just another white speck. Yeah, it's looks. a naked eye object. You can see yeah. it with your naked eye. Mm. It just looks like a little star until you get a good telescope on it. But yeah. it's there. Fantastic. Thank you, Liam. How about you, George? Um, yeah, again, it's a difficult question, really, because there's so many, there's such a range of different things you can see in the night sky. But um, some people probably think it's quite a boring one. But I think Mars uh, recently had its uh, closest approach or closest point to us back in, gosh, when was it now, October or November? No, we were locked down for November. So December, maybe, I can't remember. Um, <laughs> It looked amazing and you could just about pick out some detail on it, uh, some surface detail, perhaps uh, one of the polar ice caps as well. And I never thought you could uh, you could see that much detail on Mars' surface. So for me, that was quite a learning curve, uh, seeing it like that. So um, that's fresh in the mind. But also, if I can just pop on a, a virtual background, um, my other one would definitely be M13. Oh, yeah. Hercules globular cluster which i'm sure someone else is probably going to say because it's you've a bit of a shadow in there as well you've got the propeller the propeller yeah there's a shadow a three spoke shadow is off to the left it goes in your picture it goes from there to there to there oh i'm not and sure oh is it here oh, all right yes no, go yeah. the other way go over here stop stop go back it's right in the middle i'm losing up, my finger now up. Uh, Liam knows. There, that's it. That's one of the uh, spikes oh, of the propeller. Yeah. yeah. That's the uh, it's, it's called the propeller. That's oh, a right. really good image. There we go. So, George, Still how, learning. <laughs> where, whereabouts would you find that? Sorry, just for someone that's relatively fresh to, to astronomy, you know, where would you be in the night sky? Would you be looking to, to see yeah. that? Yes. It's, it's a tricky one, actually, uh, to find. So, you, you need okay. to find the constellation of Hercules, first of all, uh, which I always do, actually, by looking for Vega. First of all, okay. So it's a good one to look at at this time of year, actually, moving into spring. And Vega is one of the brightest stars in the night sky. Um, sort of got a bluish white hue to it. And then if you, and this is really bad, really bad astronomy, but if you go to the right a bit and down a bit, okay, you can come across a sort of tablet or sort of tombstone shape of four stars. Okay. And it's within that region. That's the constellation of Hercules. It's within that region. Uh, that you can find this object, but it's not naked eye visible. So it is a bit of a, I'd say, probably more advanced target uh, to try and find. I'd definitely stick to Mars, Saturn, Jupiter, the Moon, um, and poss possibly uh, the Andromeda Galaxy and uh, what's behind Liam there, the Orion Nebula, for, for, for beginners. Well, it's a stunning thing to look at, and and certainly now I can remember it. Is I'll be looking at Vega right down a bit, find the two internal <laughs> stars, and that's where I'll start. So thank it's you. It's a rough that. guide. It's a rough guide. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Roy? Is that a particular favourite you have? Um, the moon. I've got to go with Naz on this. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, I, I just, I just want to say, George, there's no such thing as bad astronomy. It's just like you know, you, it's just whatever you do, it works. I mean, I've, I, I tell people who come to the observatory, even if you've got children's binoculars, toy binoculars, use them because you'll, you'll, you'll be like, what? 
and then go to Lidl or Aldi because every now and then they sell binoculars for 15 or 20 quid. And yeah. I've got three pairs of Aldi binoculars at the observatory just to demonstrate. You've got five, yeah, just to demonstrate to people that for 15, 20 quid, you can you can do it. I mean, we've got some nice bigger ones there as well. I remember, Liam, about four or five years ago, um, I went to every Aldi in the region and bought 20 pairs, <laughs> bought 20 pairs because they were that good <laughs> that year. They were that good. Um Excellent. I just wanted to show this as well to people who are looking how if they want to find out how to find things. This is an app called uh, Sky Map on your Android phone. And oh, if yes. any of you astronomers uh, will or anybody has um, iPhones or anything, maybe you could do a similar thing and just kind of show the Sky Safari or whatever, because I don't have that and I don't know which is the best. But that's just, you know, wherever you point it, it shows you what's in the sky. Um, so with some cheap binoculars and a free app like that, you know, you can all be doing astronomy. But I think Naz and I would agree, you don't need an app to find the moon. That's true. No. Yeah. <laughs> this, this picture behind me was taken with a mobile phone held to the eyepiece of the telescope at the Battlesteads. And that's another thing, I, you know, we, when you come to our observatories and we've all got amazing kit, if the moon's up and it's a moon watch night, you've got to ask your astronomer to, to either for you, use your phone and take a picture or let you take a picture. And the thing I love about stuff like this is you can take like, take a, like 30 or 40 pictures, yeah. delete all the rubbish ones and then leave one and go, look what I did with my mobile phone. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> That's fantastic. But I, lo I love it because I mean, just in this one picture, right, you've got um, these craters down here uh they're called that's that's a bay that's a bay crater these are ghost craters so they're craters that formed and then got filled with lava by that whole sea over here on the term which way am i going over there not that way over there on the terminator if you look you can see those two little dots there are mountain tops that are just catching the sunrise yes yeah so if you were sitting on that mountain on the moon you'd be watching the sunrise in front of you and if you look close enough on some of these pictures not this one as my background but well, you know, you can do this with your own mobile phone. You can mm. see the shadows of the mountains and the volcanoes on the moon. I mean, why could we? I mean, look at that. What's going on with that there? There's yeah. two of them smashed together. So I love it. Who it's just a detail, isn't it? It's just a yeah. detail, and you can visualize it more. Than, yes, yeah. because it's 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 so, so close. Yeah, so the moon every day, all day. Definitely. Okay, those are good ones. How about you, Will? So, um, what I've been doing since lockdown is obviously no events, re real world events. I've been doing moon watches. So I've, I think I've done about 130 events on my Facebook looking at the moon. However, my favorite object isn't the moon. That's well, because it's been already been picked. But no, no, it's because um, my favorite object is something called NGC 457, which is the owl cluster or the oh, ET right. cluster. And the reason why it's my favorite is because whenever I do an event, you know, we, we always go through the stuff, right? We'll, oh, here's a planet. Fantastic. Here's uh, Orion. Fantastic. And then I just freak everyone out by saying, I'm now going to show you an alien, right? And then there's a moment in everyone's sort of thought patterns where they're thinking to themselves, is this guy like a lunatic? You know, what's going on here? So I go, right, I'm going to show you. Have you ever wondered where E.T. went? Yeah. E.T., he went home. And let me show you. So we find the ET cluster. And it's honestly the best reaction because it's a cluster of stars. These are some of the youngest stars out there. They're about 20 million years old, um, 8,000 light years away. But the, the brightest stars in that cluster actually looks like ET. Um, I always go, look for its eyes. Then you'll see his little legs and his little arms or you can call it the Johnny Five Cluster, if you wish. That's like the newer version, right? So honestly, I've, I've been to the States, Yosemite National Park, like middle of nowhere. And there was a, um, an astronomy society there. And um, I managed to commandeer a telescope and run my own event within it. And these Americans were loving it. You know, I was like, let me show you an alien. They're like, honey, this guy's going to show us an alien, you know? And it was just, it was just brilliant. So Lots of really nice memories, and I always th find that that is the funnest one yeah. of all of them. 
And that's it, isn't it? It is about this. It's about making story. We'll come on to the sort of story making element because that in itself is a is a whole subject, isn't it? In terms of, you know, we are used to certain names for constellations linked to certain stories based in Greek mythology, but different cultures have different approaches, and we'll talk about that. But let me just ask ask or answer a question, or maybe ask the question that's been raised by one of our, our viewers this evening, MJ. Um, and she's basically asking this to all the observatories. Can you observe observe observatories please stream more events as regular thing and if so what kind of topics would you like to do in the future so anyone want to come in there to say if they've got any plans to stream any events in the future perhaps well i just want to put in there and say um as i was saying I, i've been doing so many uh events on my photography page so i'm um, doing astronomy for beginners uh, aurora talks um just as much information as I can, because obviously people we find, you know, we just do the basics, showing people how to find things in the night sky. Um, there is an absolute interest, isn't there? A growing interest now, more than ever, of people getting into astronomy. Mm -hmm. And so the, 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 the free talks that I've just been doing, you know, we, we will continue. I'll, I'll always do it. I, di I, did, I did one the other day. I have to say it was mental, right? Absolutely mm -hmm. nuts. It got um, 1.1 million views. Okay, <laughs> that that was 10 days ago. the The only challenge is, and I urge you guys, if you can help me, is I, I don't know why I'm saying this, but I've been I've been infiltrated by flat earthers, right? Oh, so fantastic. honestly, it's crazy, <laughs> right? So I've you you have to I've been to, oh, you, I've had to block 200 people on it, but there's loads of people love it. But yeah, there's loads Maybe of flat we should earthers. do a live stream. How about this, Will? Right, you and me. And Liam, and maybe Naz, and because she loves the moon, uh, let's do a live stream where we talk about flat earth myths and we talk about moon landing myths and we invite these people along and then just annihilate their bad science. I'm up for that. Are you up for that, Naz? I mean, if the flat earthers are up for that, then so. <laughs> I feel like it's just going to be, it's just going to be them trying to convince us that the earth is flat. So. <laughs> okay. Maybe right. <laughs> okay. Well, that's, yeah, it's fantastic. Um, okay. Let's think about, you know, if you're starting out, we've talked about, obviously, if you want to start out, if you really want to have a good view of the night sky, you need to find somewhere that's dark. But if you're not really used to this, and as you say, Will, we've seen a lot of people, um, that have kind of discovered the night sky during lockdown. You know, they're literally doing astronomy in their backyard and, and seeing what they can see and, and certainly following blogs and, and the like. But, you know, what sort of advice would you give to someone beginning, you know, starting out thinking, I'd like to get more into astronomy? You know, what would be the path or what would you say, well, the first five things you should be doing is this? How about that, Will? Yeah, I mean, I, I always say that when people like me, you know, I always think back to when I was looking at the night sky for the first time and all I, all I thought I could see were just stars, right? Cause it can be so overwhelming. You just see stars everywhere. And, and I remember thinking, what you can see a planet. Is that, is that actually possible? So I would say to start off with is, you know, like I do with my beginners talks is to mention that these are the different things that we can see. So with the naked eye, when you look out on the night sky, let's just identify these different things. So whether it's, you know, a star, a binary star, or a star cluster, a nebula, um, you know, these sort of things just to make people realize, because I find, I mean, you know, I did 147 events at Kielder, right? So it was very intense over a 12 month period. And the folks would come up and you'd say, right, we're gonna show you this. And what I found was the general public, the, the knowledge is fairly limited. So we just teach the very basics of it to start off with, not overwhelm people with crazy, crazy things, just the basics. Understand that we see different constellations at di different times of the year, because that's another thing that people don't realize. Um, you know, understand there are also more better times to stargaze as well. And, and that's fine, you know, when the moon is out, look at the moon, but when it's not out, these are the things that you can try. So that's what I would say, Duncan, I would say that it's just to, really take down uh, educate people to make them realize what sort of things we can see and w also what does it mean like what is a star cluster what is a nebula you yes. know what is a galaxy and 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 hopefully from that they they get enthusi 
enthusiastic enough to come and visit us in Northumberland. Yeah. Fantastic. Yes. And do they need any special equipment apart from, as you say, we talk about what you can see with the naked eye. You know, how do people feel about if someone comes up to them and say, what kind of telescope? You know, I've got my child here's 12, wants to get into astronomy. You know, what kind of telescope should I buy them? Do you recommend a telescope or yeah, I, I mean, binoculars? Absolutely. I mean, I, 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 we have binoculars as well, you know, like Roy has a Battlestead. Um, but me personally, um, I don't know what it is. I am so pro Dobsonian telescope. You know, mm, I yeah. always, always oh, recommend yeah. that is the one to go for. I always say, if you're starting out, avoid anything with the letters EQ in it, like an yes. equatorial <laughs> mount, yes. like avoid like the plague because, and, and funny enough, that, that type of telescope seems to be targeted at beginners, yes. you know, and yeah. how many times Roy, you know, and, and Liam and so on, where people turn up with their little EQ telescope and they say, oh, I've just bought this. Can you teach me how to use it? Oh, and they've spent, and also they've spent maybe 120 quid or 150 quid on one where the tripod's basically made of paper and the telescope's a really long, thin tube and, you know, all the gearings in the mount of nylon and you just know it's going to last a week. Um, I just are we perhaps at a point now um, just looking at the time with 15 minutes or so to go where we can all just unmute now and join in as as and, and when because this this com this particular topic is fantastic and I, I wasn't sure whether Naz or George but uh, we, I don't quite know whose role is what but within the observatory the Keel observatory in terms of children and teaching does I've got in my head that it's Naz but I'm not sure if that's true no, it's not me. Um, okay. George is a little bit more involved with it, but it's actually Adam who is our educational uh, lead. George mm. does the science development part, so that's why those two kind of work really well together. So on to George. <laughs> oh, sorry. Just the reason I said that is because you just you did a couple of bits to video, didn't you, this week for um, Naz for um, the Robson Green for things like that. And I'm yeah. wondering what advice you would give to, to uh, like, so I've, I've literally just had an email. Um, my my nine-year-old daughter is, is intending to become an astrophysicist. So this is uh, a young girl who's yeah. looking at it. And let's be honest here. Look at this panel. It's a predominantly male panel. And we have to recognise that physics and astronomy, um, for a variety of very unfortunate reasons, has been predominantly male. Um and I just wonder if we should give you some time, Naz, uh, to just speak up to this particular little girl who's nine. And there was a 10-year-old girl last night who was also doing the same thing or watching, um, who could look at you and think, that's who I want to be in a few years' time. What would yeah. you say to those nine or 10-year-old little girls? Um, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a tough one because, like you say, it is a male-dominated dom field. Um, so it can be quite hard for you to see and picture yourself in that field. Um, when you can't visualize yourself working in that field or being interested in that field, it can be quite hard and intimidating to want to go into it. Um, I think the main thing for me, um, I also did a few bits to, to video for uh, the International Women in Science Day as well. And, um, I was asked, you know, what message I would give to myself or anyone who uh, a younger girl. Yeah, that's the one. That's the one. Yeah, wanting to go into um, the scientific field. And I just said that um, they need to surround themselves with as many um, scientific influences as possible. And it doesn't matter where that comes from. For me, it came from having really great physics teachers in high school because teachers and educators can be so important um you can have teachers that take <clears throat> most interesting of subjects and make them really boring oh, or you can yeah. take teachers that take a really boring subject and just make it seem like the most out of the world out of this world interesting topic and you just want to know everything about it um, and that was the case with me. And then um, I also said that I went on trips to places like Jodrell Bank as well. Mm -hmm. um, so surrounding yourself with those influences is really important. And um, I was lucky that I had a family that encouraged me to look up and get involved in this field as well. Um, so that's where it really starts. But um, then later on, when, you, when, you, when you're um, in high school or wondering whether, what you want to study at A-levels and university, um, I think a lot of people can be intimidated by the fact that it is male domin dominated and they think that they don't belong in that field and they don't have a space in that field. Um, and I think it's really important to not listen to that little voice in your head 
Um, and I say it's a voice in your head, but it's 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 also due to society as well. It makes you believe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you just need to fight against that. And if it's something that you want, just really believe that you are entitled to hold that space in the field and also to ask for help as well, because um, a lot of people can could be like, well, everyone else seems like they're getting on fine and I'm struggling and all this. Maybe I don't belong in this field and stuff, but mm. um, it's it's hard work that that, that is the, the key to success. So, um, and everyone needs a little bit of help every now and then. So, um, hold on to those inspirations and work hard and um, surround yourself with people that um, encourage you as well. I, I like what you say about speaking up as well. I've got a five-year-old little girl and um, I just see it in her class and, you know, the boys don't want to, don't want to play with the girls because they're this or that. The other, and the girls don't want to play with the boys because they're <laughs> too noisy and whatever. Um, and so I, I liked what you said there about speaking up. I'm definitely going to make sure my little girl does that all the definitely. time definitely yeah it's yeah. it's really important to just like put your hand up I was I was that annoying kid in high school that was asking really complicated questions in physics class and the teacher was like no stop asking me this you don't you <laughs> can't explain this to you in in year 10 terms <laughs> um but yeah I think it's really important to to be involved and put your hand up and and um be as loud as as everyone else's <laughs> yes yeah cool that's great. I, I found, as I say, I'm, I'm not a trained in any way in, in science, but, you know, I've become more interested in science because of astronomy, because of, you know, people showing me things. And then I wanted to know about gravitational fields and I wanted to know about. So I started reading up about sort of Einstein and quantum physics just in my own time, you know, just something I probably wouldn't have done beforehand, you know, just just to find out some of the reasoning behind it, but not to lose sight of that initial wow factor, you know, that wow factor of just looking at something to a telescope or just looking at the night sky on a really clear night. You mustn't let that sense of wonder disappear, you know, and that's the one thing about astronomy, because it never does, you know, it's a bit like, you know, anything to do with nature, you know, I, I spend a lot of time and have spent a lot of time doing guided walks in the countryside and talking about wildlife and, and landscapes and that sense of, of wonder around nature. And, and people, that's really meaningful to people these days, isn't it? Especially with this pandemic and lockdown, people have not just discovered the night sky, but they've also that want, you know, seeking out that reconnection with nature as well. How important do you think that is these days, you know? Maybe, you know, in the last sort of 10 minutes or so, maybe let's, let's start looking at the future. You know, is the, the time good for astronomy now? Is it, you know, it seems right. You've got, you know, the, the recent Mars landing. Um, you've got a lot of stuff going on in space. You mm. know, how, how do you feel about astronomy for the future? Um, and I'll go to Liam. Well, I'm looking at the way things are. I mean, like you say, there's a lot going on in astronomy at the moment, like you say, the Mars rovers, plans for the future to go to Mars, back to the moon. And everybody's reading about it because they're all stuck in the house. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, once we're released back into the wild, there's a lot of people going to be wanting to come out and find out what it's all about. So I'm very, very hopeful that our, um, our environment's going to see a massive influx of interest from the public. And like you said, nature, I mean, up here in Stonehawk, my intention is not only to do the night and stuff, but also to do nature trails and all that sort of stuff, photography, daytime and nighttime. So I'm just waiting to be let loose again. Release the Liam. Release the Liam. <laughs> <laughs> let him run free. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you raise a very good point, though, Liam, because it's not just about stargazing. The nighttime environment isn't just, you know, it's wonderful for stargazing, yeah. but people are fascinated by wildlife. They're fascinated mm. also about the stories of the night as well, you know, in terms of, you know, our culture, the culture of the night. You know, yeah. I, I was talking to you about this, sort of mentioned the border area of, of, you know, the borders of Scotland and England. It's fascinating history. Yeah, Most of it all was that. enacted at night time. You know, you had the yeah. border reavers and the raids that were taking mm -hmm. place either side of the English and Scottish borders. And it yeah. normally took place at night, you know, and then you had the hot trod where they kind of followed the pursuers, you know, through the, the mosses and the moors uh, at night. You even had the Battle of Otterburn in 1388, you know, yeah. where, with um, Percy of um, Shakespeare fame. You know, that was supposedly a nighttime battle. You know, yeah. there's a 
so much more we can sort of engage people about the night as well. Yeah. But we, uh, Will, you know, how do you see the future of astronomy? And Sonia, from your plans with the uh, twice brewed in observatory, it sounds fantastic. Well, yeah, I mean, as Liam was saying, there's just so much happening, isn't there? I mean, I think for me, what, what I'm most excited about is we've got several things, right? We've got the James Webb Telescope, which is going up, which is going to revolutionize like loads of research and findings. We've got the ELT being built in Chile as well. So that's, again, going to be huge. But also the Artemis project. So the first mm -hmm. females or women to walk on the moon. Um, that's going to be mm -hmm. so exciting. And I think mean, everything just seems to be coming together where also, as Liam was saying, people have been at home, they've been stuck in. And actually, the reason I would say why astronomy has picked up so much is because people haven't been able to go out, but they've been able to go outside of their house and notice mm -hmm. more of the night sky, because that's really the only thing that's changing, you know, for the environment. So I would say that the future, as far as astrotourism is involved, it can only get bigger, it can only become... I think also as well, you know, let's not forget, and, and this is something I do forget, is because I was born in Newcastle, I lived on the outskirts of Newcastle, relatively dark skies in comparison to somewhere like mm. central London, yeah. Birmingham, Manchester, where the vast majority of population live. You know, I, I cannot imagine what it would be like to live in a city where you're only going to see about five or 10 stars or 20 stars. So we, I take what we're trying to say is I take it for granted. So for the folks that when I take photographs, you know, of Twice Brood here mm -hmm. and I post it on my, my page and the reaction, you know, people say, oh, I can't believe it. Oh, it's amazing. And it brings me back down to earth, you know, pardon the pun, to make me think, hang on a second. You know, a lot of people out there, they, they really haven't seen the Milky Way before, as Naz was saying. They haven't seen, you know, the dark skies and they certainly haven't looked through a telescope in a dark sky site. So I absolutely believe that the future is... I was going to say bright, but the opposite of that. And yeah, it's, a, it's very exciting times for, for, for all of us in the dark sky parks. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. Roy, how about you? What plans have you got maybe in the future? Um, or what would you like to see happen in the next sort of 12 months or so? Yeah, I, do you know what? I don't even know what my personal plans are because there's so much going on around so many different things at the minute. But I do feel like for me, it's about bringing the passion of dark skies to, to children that can't afford to do it. Um, you know, it's like you want to go to Kielder, um, you need to be able to drive out there for a start. You know, you need to have parents that are willing to drive you all the way out there. Uh, it's the same with me. It was the same with all of us, isn't it? I mean, actually, this, yeah. we're all pretty remote. I think I think Bastard is possibly the closest one, but that's still a 45, 50-minute drive if you're not, you know, being too careful about your speed, I guess. Um, and then when you get there, it's 20 quid a ticket for an adult or whatever, or 25 or around about there or thereabouts, maybe a bit less, um, you know, 15... 10, 15 quid for kids and so on. And you probably have to throw a meal in as well or a bit of food. And, and there is just so many children that I've, I've, I've worked with in schools that, you know, they haven't even gone to the Long Acre Wood behind mm. my house, which is free in there. They, they, live, they live 10 miles or whatever it is to the beach and they just don't go there. I remember reading the Glover Report, the Glover Report, which yes. I know you're a big fan of and it, I, we all need to be aware of this, talking about getting every school child in the UK out into the national parks to spend one day and one night, and that's the important thing for me, under those dark skies. And we need to make that happen um, so much. And, and I, for me, that's where I think the future needs to be. Yeah, lots of things we're all doing commercially for ourselves and for the rush tourism, and that's fantastic. Yes, let's tackle light pollution, but let's, you know, Think, can I just, if we can bring this conversation right back to what it was that inspired each one of you, each one of us when we were little to look up at the skies and then what can we do to make that happen for the eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 year olds living in Newcastle, living in Blythe, living in Gateshead, you know, um, where, where they don't even get that opportunity to go to the end of their, 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 their street into the local forest. So, what I'm going to say is, I, I, for me, for the future needs to be making every kid realise that they could just step out their back door or their front door 
They need to, you know, be warm. They need to give themselves 10 minutes minimum for their eyes to adjust to the dark. Um, unless the moon's up now, so in which case they can just look at the moon, just look <laughs> at the moon. But if the moon's not up, they just need to give themselves 10 minutes minimum and, you know, and just look at the sky and, and appreciate that you're on this rock flying around a star, an average star, you know, in the middle of nowhere, really, in the universe. And that you can see things that are trillions and trillions of miles away and what you don't have to be a scientist to appreciate that you know kill the escape velocity take a picture with you with your phone yes. don conlon the, the the poet write a poem you know paint a picture just mm. get out there and do something and that's to me where i think we need to be for the future well i think that's a very good point to make and sorry now sorry did you sorry, want to... just on your point there roy um with like what inspired us as kids to go into astronomy um, and like you say it requires um the adults around you as yeah. a child to be very invested in your interests yeah. and i think the key to getting a lot of kids more a lot more kids involved is making sure that the adults around their parents and such um, actually believe that astronomy is um, something that they should invest time and money in. Yeah. I think a lot of people think that astronomy is just this hobby, you know, you're just looking up at the skies, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it just, like we said before, it invokes um, this feeling inside of you to want to know more about the world around you. Um, and that can lead you into all different areas of science. Um, so it's not just about astronomy, but like I say, I do think it's really important that we make the adults believe that astronomy is actually worth it and important. Yeah. yeah. Couldn't agree more. And as I say, being endlessly curious, isn't it? And that's about everything, you know, not just yeah. about the night time, but about wildlife, about nature, and just trying to, to, to find out more. And you've all demonstrated, we've all come into this in different paths. Some of us have got degrees in astrophysics, others, some of us don't, and we've just learned it later on in life. But we're still inspired by the night sky. We still love it. We still have that passion. And we hope that others, and I know all of you, because I know, Roy, you've been talking about your programs, and I know Kilda's got a thorough education program. Liam, you do wonderful work with the community, and Will, you've been doing work as well. You are kind of the ambassador you're imparting that enthusiasm onto others to the next generation and for that I'd like to thank you very much indeed and I'd also like to thank you all for participating in this nighttime chat I think we literally only have about a minute or so to go but as the embers are dying down now in front of us thank you very much indeed for your contributions this week you have done a huge amount to make um more people aware of the beauty of the night sky here in the Northumberland International Dark Sky Park and we've got a lifetime ahead to to do more and um and i look forward to working with you all in the future and thank you again roy for for being a fantastic host for the whole uh week and for will for doing your wonderful online work and for all of you so all the very best to you and to everyone out there thank you for joining us this evening um i hope you've picked up a few tips and i hope that your enthusiasm for the night sky continues for the rest of your life thank you thank you everybody